last state lab we did entitled Relationships and Biodiversity. First thing that we need to know about relationships and biodiversity is the technique we learned called paper chromatography. If you look at the diagram, it looks exactly like the setup that we did in class. Note that the water line is below where the pigment was placed. The pigment is going to be represented by the green dot. Now the reason why we did that was because we did not want the water to wash away the pigment. The water eventually moves out the chromatography paper. As it moves up the chromatography paper, quite a few yellow separated it in different colors that were located in the flower. Based on this, we could tell the sequence they were dated. The ones that had the most simple color pattern were the most recent to date. So, why did we use paper chromatography? We used paper chromatography to separate a mixture. In our case, the mixture was pigment. The next thing we did was something called gel electrophoresis. If you look on the diagram to the right, it does a pretty good job of summing up what we did. Gel electrophoresis. Our first step was to use enzymes to cut the DNA. If you don't remember, what we did was we cut in between the ribosome A2 and B2. We then counted up the number of bases that were present, and then we glued them into the appropriate spot. DNA is negative, so DNA is attracted to the positive side. The DNA bands move according to size. That means the larger bands are going to lag. That's because the larger bands are heavy. The larger bands are going to be closest to the well. They are represented by the green highlighted bands. The smaller bands are swift. That's because they are lighter and can travel much further faster. The smaller bands are represented by the yellow highlighted bands. Now, why would we use a technique like this? The reason why we'd use gel electrophoresis could be for a crime scene investigation, a paternity test, medical testing. This one is a little bit different than the examples that we've seen where we were trying to match one suspect or one species with another species to see which two are most closely related. This example is looking at parents. Parents, that means that the one, two, five, and six are supposed to represent potential children. Remember, you get half your DNA from your mom and half your DNA from your dad. So no one's going to be a complete match. If you look here, I've highlighted the parents in green. So what you want to see is you want to see at least one gene from the mother and one gene from the father in each of the samples. If we look at potential child number one, you'll notice that potential child number one shares one band with the mother and then one band with the father. Therefore, um, then subject number one is going to be a child of those two. Next one, child, then child number two, and if you look here, this band actually doesn't match up with or four. Based on that evidence alone, you can say that this person is not a child of those two parents. If we go to potential child number five, if we look, you'll see that once again, the bands match up. That indicates that this person is a child of these two people. Last one, potential child six. If we look, once again, the bands match up. That means that this couple has three children. The three children are child one, five, and six. The reason why two is not their child is because the banding patterns do not match. Another technique that we learned is how to use the amino acid chart. First thing you have to do, if you look on the chart, it says DNA base sequence. There's a little chart. They've given that to you. You need to remember the base pairing rules for when you convert DNA to messenger RNA. 
Remember that A is going to go to U. That's a difference. Next thing we have is T goes to A, C goes to G, and G goes to C. Now take a minute and try to figure out what your messenger RNA code would be in this case. Feel free to use the base pairing rules that are laid out above the diagram. So based on the base pairing rules, remember A is going to go to U. So our first one is going to be U, U, C. Next one is G, G, U. Next one is A, C, U. And the final one is U, G, U. For our next section, we need to learn how to use the amino acid genetic code chart. How do you use this? Well, if you look, there's a section called first base, second base, and third base. I have highlighted each one of these in a different color, so it's easy for you to follow along. We have our first base, which is represented by U. Where did I get that from? Right here. After that, I need to find the second base. The second base is also U. Notice, though, we're referring to a different section of the chart. We want to find out where those two areas overlap. That area is now highlighted in yellow. From that, we need to find U, U, C. So U, C goes with C, H, C. Take a second and try to figure out the next three amino acids. We've got G, G, U. You're going to use the same exact technique to find your first base, which is G. Find your second base, which is also G. And then find out where the two of those intersect. G, G, in this box here. So our G, G, U is going to be Y. A, C, U, you're going to use the same exact technique. For A, C, U, you wind up getting C, H, R. And then for U, G, U, microscope. You know, the parts. While this wasn't formally introduced during this lab, it was kind of re-emphasized. That's why I've put it here. First one that we have is the eyepiece. Eyepiece is going to be A. The eyepiece gives you 10 times the magnification. Next thing we have is C. C is the fine adjustment. It brings the image into fine focus. And then we have D, the diagram. The diagram is that disc is that disc that is right underneath the stage, and it allows you to control the amount of light that's coming through. That enables you to actually see whatever you're looking at on the slide. Other parts that you should know but are not labeled are going to be source adjustment. Source adjustment brings things into rapid focus. You should only be using this when you're under low power, otherwise you might damage the slide. The other parts that you should know are going to be the two adjusted lenses. The part of the adjusted lens that you should know will be also magnified. Sometimes they'll ask for global magnification. And if you're trying this for global magnification, you should know that that's just going to be the eyepiece times the adjustment. is looking at an image actually underneath the microscope. Remember, images underneath the microscope are going to be upside down and backwards. When you're looking at the image, the first thing that you want to figure out, hmm, look at those. What's wrong with those? Why is the one under the high power not ideal? What can we do to fix it? But if you look at the one under low power, you can see the entire spectrum. But when you look at it under high power, some of it gets cut off. How can we fix that? Simple. We want to move the specimen right to the middle. Once you move it to the middle, that will ensure that it stays in the field of view when you move it to high power. Other things that you need to know about when looking at something underneath the microscope is the staining. Staining allows you to better see whatever specimen you're looking at. Image is not seen, you might see something more like this. 
meaning you wouldn't be able to see the detail of the vitamin cell. That's it for relationships and bi biodiversity.